All right, uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna to talk to you about a uh, visualization for looking at clusterings uh, with different numbers of clusters uh, and trying to work out um, which is kind of more useful. Uh, what I'm gonna show you could be applied to any kind of field where you're clustering stuff or any kind of clustering method. Um, but I'm gonna use some of my data as an example. So I'm doing a PhD in bioinformatics at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, uh, which basically means I look at gene sequencing data. Um, one of the labs that we work with is the, the kidney development lab at, at MCRI. So they're interested in how the kidney grows um, and how disease develops in the kidney. One of the things they do is uh, take skin cells, um, convert them to stem cells, and then grow these little balls of kidney cells, which we call a kidney organoid. So in here, there's lots of different kinds of kidney cells. Um, but we don't know exactly what kinds are there or what they're doing, what genes they're turning on and off. Um, and that's something they're really interested in. So to look at that in a bit more detail, we use a technique called single cell RNA sequencing. First, we take these little balls, uh, we split them up in individual cells, and then we measure which genes are turned on and off in each cell. Um, so these can be pretty large data sets. Usually there uh, you have about 10,000 genes, uh, and thousands or tens of thousands of cells that we've sequenced. Um, and we want to group these cells together, look at what genes they express, and work out what cell types are there. Um, but with any kind of clustering problem, there's also ways. One question you've got to kind of think about, which is how many clusters do we, do we want? How many make sense? How many is meaningful? Um, so here's a couple of examples. On the left, we've got a really kind of coarse clustering, we've got three different groups. And on the right, we've got uh, a more high resolution clustering where we've got eight of 16 different groups. Um, so there's a kind of, there's various statistical things you can calculate and compare between these to work out which is maybe better. Um, but another thing you might notice is that there's kind of a relationship between the two. So for example, this green cluster here uh, splits up into these three here. So these are almost subclusters of that. Um, and that's almost like a, a lineage kind of species relationship so like we saw before. So we're in biology and when we see these kind of relationships, the kind of default response is to draw a tree. So here's an example of a tree which we've kind of already seen. Um, uh, this is a tree of life. So at one resolution we've got these three really big groups, bacteria, archaea and eukaryotes. Um, but if we look at move down the tree we can see things in more and more resolution. We get more and more specific until we get to to individual species. Um, so kind of combining a clustering and this kind of tree idea, I kind of thought, can we make a tree of clusters instead of a, a tree of life? So trees are a kind of a special kind of a graph, and every graph has two things. They have nodes and they have edges. Um, so I'm going to make my edges to be the clusters. Oh, sorry, my nodes to be the clusters. Um, so for each cluster, we've got some kind of a resolution for this particular clustering, and that might be K if we were doing something like K-means. Uh, we've got an ID for the cluster, and I'm going to record the size, so the number of samples in the cluster. Um, if I say cells, I apologize, I'm used to thinking of cells, but I mean samples of any kind. Um, so we also need some edges. Our edges are all going to go from a cluster at a lower resolution to a cluster at a higher resolution. So we're going to get more detailed as we move down the tree. And we can record some information about these as well. So I can look at just the number of samples uh, that form that edge that have started in this cluster at a low resolution and end up this high cl resolution cluster. Uh, but a problem with that is as we're splitting up our tree, these are naturally going to get smaller and smaller as our clusters get more specific. So it might be more useful to instead look at some kind of a proportion. So let's imagine we have this uh, small mini example tree. We've started with 100 samples, um, and this is our kind of our root node where everything's in one cluster. We then do a clustering with two clusters. Uh, it breaks up into this cluster of 60 samples and this cluster of 40. There's a couple of different proportions we can, we can define. So one is a, what I'm going to call a from proportion, which is to divide the number of samples that have moved along this edge 
by the number of samples in the, the low resolution cluster that they started in. Um, and then we can kind of do the opposite of that, which I'm going to call a true proportion, which is to take the number on the edge and divide it by the, the number in the final cluster. So if we calculate these two values uh, on this little example, we can see this cluster has a form proportion of 0 0.6, so 60% of the cells here and up here, uh, 0 0.4 for this edge, but the two proportions are both 1. Uh, if we make this a little bit complex and add more complex and add another layer, the two edges at the top and the bottom are pretty similar to what we just saw, um, but the ones in the middle are a bit more interesting because this node has two edges coming into it. So here, the from proportion for this edge is 0 0.3, but the two proportion is 0 0.6, and this one's uh, 0 0.25 and a third. So what that tells us is for this edge here, uh, a third, sorry, two-thirds of the cell samples in this cluster came from here, and one-third of the cell samples in this cluster went here. Um, so the from proportion kind of tells us how important that edge is to the starting cluster, and the two proportion tells us how important it is to the final cluster. Um, I've found, played around with these a little bit, and I've kind of found that the two proportion is a bit more useful. Uh, it, tells it, it lets us do a better job of, say, getting rid of edges that aren't important because they don't have any samples on them. So how do we actually work these out? Um, on the left here is the kind of data you might start with if you were going to build one of these trees. So we've got all our samples as the rows, our different clustering resolutions, and the numbers here are labels saying that this sample is in this cluster at a particular resolution. So to build up our edges, we loop along the different resolutions. Uh, we look at the unique clusters in each resolution. So for the first resolution, there's only cluster 1 and cluster 2. Um, we select one of those at a time. We then look at the next resolution along, and again, select each of the, the um, different unique clusters at that resolution. And then we basically count up how many pairs there are. So here we have, there's only one sample that's in cluster one at resolution one and cluster one at resolution two. If we do that for all of our, um, all of our resolutions and samples and clusters, uh, we get a table that looks like this. So this describes each of our edges. We're saying that this edge goes from resolution one, cluster one, to resolution two, cluster one, and that there's one sample that moves along that edge. Um, you'll probably find if you do this that you get a bunch of edges with zeros in them, um, and those are edges that obviously there's no connection between those clusters, so we can get rid of those before we do anything else. So going back to the data I started with before, um, I've done this process and built a tree, and the tree looks like this. So here we start at the top, uh, and as we move down the tree, we get uh, a greater and greater resolution, more and more clusters. Each of our, our circles is a cluster. Um, the size tells us how many samples are in that cluster. Uh, and the colors of the edges indicate how many samples are moved along, and the transparency is the, that two proportion. Um, so the, the least important edges are all faded out, as you can see down here. So these are the, the two clusterings I showed you at the very start, with three and, and 16 clusters. So we can still see that these exist, but now we can see the relationship between them, how we got from these clusters to here. Um, so to point out a couple of these that are a bit interesting, this one on the very right is very distinct. It breaks off really early. It doesn't interact with any of the other clusters. Um, and if we actually look at the biology of what these are, these are, are vasculature cells, so blood cells that are mixed up with our kidney cells. They're very different. We expect them to be there, but we expect them to be very different. Um, these two here are also pretty distinct, but there's a bit more structure. So we can see they, they break off into two groups, and then this one splits again. Uh, and these are some of the, the functional kidney cells that we're really interested in finding. And then on the left, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that's not really quite clear. So here, our our clusters become less distinct, they're less stable, they change a lot. Uh, maybe that means that down here, these clusters don't really mean anything. Uh, maybe we need to go back to a resolution like at 0.5 or 
where the clusters are really, really clear and don't uh, form reactions across. So we've kind of taken data and introduced a new, new dimension, almost a, a temporal dimension, um, where we can see, if it, I think about cells a lot, so you can imagine these are clusters evolving over time. Um, but we've lost the dimension we started with, where I should kind of plotted the different clusters and how they were near each other. So I started with these kind of colored T-SNE plots with different clusterings, um, th which is almost a spatial kind of data. And I thought maybe we can combine these two. Maybe we can put our temporal tree on top of this data. So here's an example of how we might do that. Uh, on the left, we've just got um, this data showing the different clusters. So we've only got one cluster at the moment. In the middle is where we're going to plot our tree. And so all I've done is for each cluster, I've looked at all the samples in that cluster and calculated an average position. And that's where I'm going to put my dot for the tree. Um, if you kind of imagine as this is looking top down uh, view on our data, the two plots on the right are looking from the side. So this one is looking from this direction, and the bottom one is looking from the right. So now we can start to build up our tree. Uh, we can add the first clustering with three different groups, and we can see where our three clusters have actually formed. Um, we can add an intermediate cluster, and we can see which ones are splitting up and where they're going. So here is our kind of interesting kidney cells, here are our vasculature cells, and here's the other stuff. Um, and this is the, the final highest resolution clustering. We can see the points of where those, those trees are. Um, so this is kind of a bit more complex to look at, but I think it adds an extra bit of information to our, our tree and, and maybe makes it a bit easier to see some things. So to quickly sum up, um, clustering is used in lots of applications and lots of different things, but choosing the, the number of clusters to use is a, a hard but important problem. Um, I think this kind of visualization might make that process a bit easier by letting us see uh, where the clusters are, the relationship between different clusters, uh, which ones are really distinct, which ones change a lot, where samples are moving between different clusters, uh, and maybe yeah, help to make that decision. Um, so thank you for listening. Clustering method you use. So, if you use hierarchical clustering, the proportion two would always be 100%. I assume because they're always subsets of one another. Yeah. What clustering method? Uh, so this is a kind of a graph-based clustering. So it builds a graph and then segments it up, and you can there's a resolution parameter that controls how to do that. You could, I think it would work with k-means. I don't think it would work with hierarchical clustering because you've kind of already got a tree. Yeah. Um, but anything where you can kind of control the number of clusters in some way, even if it's not directly setting it, I think would work. Okay. I guess a related question is some um, clustering methods are not deterministic. So did you need to do some kind of consensus? Or... Uh, I think as far as I know, the one that I've used is deterministic. But yeah, um, yeah, that would be a problem for something like k-means. You'd probably want to run it a bunch of times at each resolution, and get a consensus, and then do it from there. Do you have any uh, plans of making this, uh, or is it already interactive or web-based? Uh, no, but I think that would be cool. The stuff I showed at the end with the kind of T-SNE and the tree on top of it, I only did two days ago. So I haven't really thought about doing it. I think that would be really cool, kind of 3D, and being able to look at it. Um, but the short answer is no. They're just static 2D plots at the moment. I wonder if there's any way to incorporate something like the entropy of a petition at a given resolution in the style of a sequence uh, barcode plot. Uh, possibly. That's probably a bit beyond what I am comfortable <laughs> understanding and doing. But yeah, um, I'm sure there's lots of more information you could put on top of that or divide things up in different ways or cover things different ways. Um, that's kind of just the first thing I thought of doing. This kind of follows on from that question a little bit, but you, you talked a bit about extracting meaning from one side of the, the plot and then the other one where it was just... So is what you're really communicating there that, that stability for you in that context is, is meaning in that 
you will layer on top of that. You know, there's a strong um, lineage relationship there or something that, that's really core. Um, yeah, I wanted to just get a little bit more from what you meant from that. Yeah, so I think um, the stability part is probably interesting. I didn't talk about the stuff on the left because it's a bit more complicated, but there is, uh, talking to the biologists and looking at stuff, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that they found interesting. So even though, in my example, the, at 0 0.5 or whatever, the cost is really stable, um, going further down, there's actually more interesting stuff to find. Um, it just becomes a bit unclear if that's how real that is, I guess, because the clusters keep changing. That could be like related to matching to a gene expression signature or something like that. When you, you get a really great fit or something like that, it might help you choose when you... Yeah, I, I guess so. So the other thing we do with these plots is instead of colouring that kind of T-sneak plot um, by the different clusters, we cluster, colour them often by gene expression because that's what people are interested in. And we can see kind of this cluster expresses these things. Um, Presented um, resolutions from zero to one steps to one. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be sensible to ask about a threshold resolution which uh, particular cluster splits? Yeah, so that's kind of kind of why I did it in the first place. I wanted to see where, when we were getting new clusters, where, how often, like how early were they appearing? Because um, to me, if they're appearing really early, that tells me they are kind of really different from everything else. If they're appearing down the lake, maybe that means I've gone too far and ended up with too many. Um, so that's kind of one of the uses of doing it, I guess. This is probably like more of a field-specific question, but I'm guessing all the biologists are usually interested in your differential genes between the clusters as you go. Have you tried, like you could have some sort of network structure between your clusters where you have differential genes and then similarly file different histograms or something? Uh, you could. That's, I don't know, again, kind of beyond what I've thought about doing. Um, I think when they're doing, yeah, I'm not sure if the, at least the people we work with would be interested in something that complex. They're more just interested in kind of seeing yeah, this is on here and it's off somewhere else. I can, I can actually second that, that um, for what you're saying, a lot of people now are asking about why are these um, clusters, these subpopulations um, uh, separating out? What are the genes that are driving them? Yeah, so we do all that kind of testing as well as a separate thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but integrating not. that will actually be very cool in the future. Right? This is a comment from Megan. Uh, this Wonderful questions, but there's also a question about how much information can you get into a single graph? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Let's thank Luke again.